Hello and welcome to episode two of the Anime Kiwi podcast. I'm Mike, and with me I have... Cat Dota. And we're still talking about kids on the slope, but first, how have you been, Cat Dota? Tired. Me too. Uh, it is 1.14 in the a.m. here. Uh, I had a very long day. It's not even 6 p.m. here, but I've just not been sleeping well. Yeah, I just got back from L.A. We went to a uh, escape room in Little Tokyo, and we did not finish. We were so close. We were at the very last very last puzzle, and then time ran out. We needed about probably four or five more minutes, and we would have had it. Yeah, I've never even seen one of those rooms. I don't know if they're even a thing here. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's very well put together. I've always wondered if they put actual game designers on those things, as in, you know, professionals. I I don't know if they have, like, game designers, but it sounded like they tested it a lot to make sure it was difficult but reasonable, which it was. Yeah, I just think, like, a really good, like, escape room would require, like, a really seasoned game designer who's, you know, understands, uh, like, teaching non-verbally and that sort of thing. I, I mean, it wasn't... So difficult that you need to do that much. I mean, it was a uh, it was zero escape theme, so like nine 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 and Virtue's Last Reward. It's a weirdly specific theme. Yeah, they uh they worked with the uh, Spike Chunsoft, the company who makes those games, to put it together and make it kind of an actual side story to those games. So it was neat. Well, I've not played one of those games, so but I would probably check something like that out. I thought it was very well done. I would go back and do one of their other puzzle rooms. Not that one, though, because I know all the solutions now. So that would not be fun. Hey, it's like playing a video game you've played before again. It can be fun. Yeah, but I I wouldn't want to spoil it for new people. Because that wouldn't be fun for them. That wouldn't be cool. Especially since it's, it's uh, like 30 bucks a pop. That's pretty expensive. Yeah, but it was fun. It was a good hour of playing a game. It was worth it. I like it enough that I will uh, say if anyone's in the L.A. area, or I think they have one in San Francisco. They have one in San Jose. I think they might have one in Seattle, too. Uh, Scrap Entertainment. They do lots of puzzle games. I think they have, like, Escape from the Time Travel Lab. I think in L.A. they're doing one in a big theater that's uh, Magic Show Escape or something. That there's, like, 200 people in the group. It's neat. Yeah, I, w- I would try something like that, but I don't know if there are even any of those things around where I live. But anyway, let's get on with Kids on the Slope. Indeed. Yeah, th- uh, these were an emotional four episodes. That's putting it lightly. Yeah. Uh, continuing. You're going to lead the summaries here, but I'll, I'll fill s- some stuff in. Uh, five continues straight off of four, where Kaoru's kissed Ritsuko and she was unhappy. And they've been uh, kind of awkward since then. Yeah, expectedly. Yeah? Considering, like, uh, you know, he just sort of springs it on her, so it's kind of understandable that she would be a bit pissed off with him. Yeah, or at least uh, con- conflicted on how she should be feeling about it. And he uh, he keeps trying to talk to her, but um, she just runs off every time he gets mm-hmm. close to her. But yeah. he's uh, later on in... The episode, she's, uh, I mean, uh, Kaoru. Kaoru? Kaoru. Is that his? Ka- Kaoru is, uh, playing with Sentaro's sister, I think. Yeah. And we're, they're doing the whole, uh, like, telephone, uh... Tin cans. Like, cans on a wire thing. Yeah. And, um, and uh, Ritsuko overhears, um, him talking about how sometimes boys don't know how to express their emotions and and that he'd hurt somebody that he cared a lot about and she overhears and she hops on the line yeah and they they seem to start you know reconciling but Mm -hmm. as she turns him down he gets all upset and and buggers off yeah she says that she likes someone else which centaur also overheard so he's uh also feeling some confliction or confusion or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, what... confusion's what I'd probably peg that as. Yeah, so Kaoru stopped going to uh, jam practice, and so he's at home, and his dad comes home. 
and uh, kind of drops the news that he found Kaoru's mother in Tokyo and has her address or her, her whereabouts, I guess, where she works. Which seems to be like a uh, like a hostess club. Is, I think what a, I could tell, like a hostess club or a yeah, or cabaret or something like that. Uh, the reason I think it might be a hostess club is because it's got the pictures of the women mm-hmm. that you would choose if you go into the club. I think yes, yeah, it it, like, it seemed it seemed like a seedy joint of some sort. Yeah, and I, I'm sure in the '60s, uh, hostess clubs were probably kind of you know looked down upon rather than the big popular thing they are now. I th- I think they're still kind of looked down upon. Not just not quite as uh, Yeah, and there's I mean they're still kind of seedy. There's the kind of thing that's in a lot of the time in red light districts. Oh, well, they're seedy as hell, but you know, just not quite as uh, underground, I guess it would be the word for it. Yeah. But um it it kind of goes on like a train ship uh, trip to meet her, and then but finds out that Centauri uh, just sort of inserts himself into the trip. Yeah, well, he can he uh, convinced Cower to go in the first place. Yeah, but without knowing that he would be taken along. Yeah, because Centaur has his his parent issues, so he said, "Do it, or else you're going to regret it if you lose your chance." And then Cower goes on the train, and Centaur is there because Train Kid set him up with a ticket. Hey, what's that kid's name? I couldn't remember it. Maro, I think. I think that might be it. Yeah, his kid knows his train schedules. But they go to try and um, they go to try and meet up with uh, brother Jun because uh, Centauri doesn't have enough money to stay in Tokyo. Yeah, but and um, but Jun hasn't been he there. Seems in a while. to be have been yeah, he's been missing for a month. I think they say. Yeah, his box is full of letters. And Kaoru uh, notices that. Uh, one of the letters is from the girl whose name is I forget. Y- Eureka. Yeah, Eureka. That's yeah, it. the the one who Centaur likes. But they end up staying with some nice people who I think give them vodka. It might have been shochu, which is uh, distilled rice. It's I guess it's close enough to vodka. Instead of p- distilled potato alcohol, it's distilled rice. It doesn't taste good at all. It's pretty gross. <laughs> Sounds like it doesn't taste good. It's it's uh, most commonly mixed with stuff, unless you want to put some hair on your chest. I hate vodka anyway, so if it tastes anything like vodka. Vodka, you got to put it in the freezer till it's cold enough that you can't taste it. That bottle has to have ice on it. It's the only alcohol that gives me like severe, severe like migraine-type hangovers. Uh, tequila gives me headaches almost immediately. I cannot drink tequila. It's it's not even like it's not even like a hangover. It just makes my head hurt immediately, days almost as soon as it touches my lips. I don't think I've even drank tequila. Some people like it a lot. The Rock likes tequila a lot. I guess it's not really a thing here. I guess not. There are cactuses in Australia, right? Uh, what? What? Sorry. There are cactuses in Australia, right? Uh, of certain types, I guess. Maybe they distill alcohol from them. I don't know. I don't even know what kind of cactus it's from. Agave, maybe. That sounds right. So, where are we up to? They're having their party with their uh, new college friends. And the next day they go meet Kaur's mom. For for dinner, lunch, for a meal. Yep. Kaur attempts to, you know... He goes there all gung-ho to try and, uh, you know... Give her what for? Give her a piece of his mind. Yeah, and to but make himself. She feel kind better. of instantly. She kind of instantly disarms him, mm-hmm. um, by being very happy to see him. And they hit it off. And um, yeah. And they have a a good conversation, and Kaoru feels better. He kind of lets loose with his uh, his feelings with her. Yeah, they have a big laugh over the fact that um, you know. That her little baby's heartbroken. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a... It's a nice moment. The thing that I took away from that moment uh, is that it's kind of like um, he doesn't really have a parental figure. So Mm -hmm. normally this would be the sort of thing you'd speak over with, uh, you know, a parent or something and try to work through emotions-wise. But 
he's not able to do that. Yeah, at this point, she's more just like an older lady friend who happens to be his mother. But what I mean is, is like, so he's got nobody who's like an authoritative or like, you know, mature person to speak this sort of stuff over with. So Mm -hmm. he's just bottling it inside and he doesn't know how to express it. So I think them laughing over it kind of enables him to get over it as such. Mm -hmm. Um, Not completely. Talking about stuff in general like that generally helps. But she was, uh, I guess she was very approachable about it. Well, I guess she asked him directly about it, and he just opened up, opened the floodgates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of an interesting moment where you can see her start to tear up, and then she brushes it off as uh, as the curry being too hot. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't really tell whether or not they were trying to play that as her actually beginning beginning to cry and her brushing it off, or Maybe whether or not both. it was just a yeah. I couldn't quite place it, and I thought that was actually like a good thing that I couldn't quite place it. Like, the thing this show does really well, and that I quite like about it, is it leaves some ambiguity in in certain situations. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not spelling everything out incredibly clearly, which I respect a lot. Yeah, I I really appreciate how the show is, like, pretty realistic about situations and how people act. It's not not playing it up for the quote-unquote camera. Yeah, like, the... The word that I'd use to describe it is, like, uh, intelligently underwritten. Mm-hmm. So, like, in certain situations, you know, you're not going to spell out everything you're thinking to someone else, like, because it might be too private or awkward or something like that. Mm-hmm. But in TV shows, they tend to do that, and it's really unrealistic. But um, in this show, they tend to leave that uh, up to the audience, or they use, like, an, an internal monologue to say that stuff instead. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty clever, and I I quite like it. Yeah, it's the character work I feel in this is really really good. It's very strong. Yeah, and the writing in general, the scene to scene stuff, and I think the plot's fine too. It's a romance plot. Sure, but um, we're leaving out probably the most important part of the episode, oh. where he gives her the lullaby of Birdland. Oh yeah, we weren't there yet. To her. Yeah, and tells her to practice it. Um, so that she can sing it next they meet. And then, and that's when you finally see her break down and become really upset, which, you know, understandably. Yeah. And that's, that's the end of episode five. Well, uh, no, the end of episode five is he goes back to the record shop again to start playing jazz. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then he, uh, igno- uh like both of, uh, Karu and Ritsuko finally acknowledge each other, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and she all... Uh, no, it wasn't her that says it. It was uh, the college guys that uh, kind of say what I think the point of the show is. Is uh, they're drinking together and they tell Kaoru to hold on to Centaur because uh, he's a good friend and, quote, unlike love affairs, friendship is for life. I think that's uh, the central pillar of what this show is and what it's about which uh you know it's it's all fine and good for a tv show uh to say that sort of thing but i think it's unrealistic you know i'm i'm nearly 30 now and i've had friendships come and go and stuff and i think it's naive to think that friendship lasts forever it's just the same as relationships you know Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's coming from also japanese standpoint and japan japan and japanese cultures more group oriented so i i feel like i know some people that they're in contact people in japan they're in contact with people they went to school with a long time ago more so than me and other people i know from over here but you know you're gonna have you're gonna have disagreements over stuff and yeah you, it's gonna fray and split like there are there are situations in this show where you know realistically they they might have never have spoken with each other again after a fight or something you know mm-hmm. and that nearly happens a couple of times yeah the next next episode two episodes uh one or the other yeah uh and the other thing i'm pretty happy with the show is, is it doesn't drag on with the the drama real quick the Kaoru and Ritsuko being super super awkward with each other lasted an episode and as of the beginning of episode six, they're they're in a, a working relationship again, at least, if not friendly. 
Yeah, and this is the realism that uh, we're talking about, how, you know, he's largely over being rejected, but he's still, you know, sensitive about it, which you mm. would be. Yeah. Um, You know, it's not like they're perfectly fine with each other now, but he's working through it. It's good stuff. Yeah. Anyways, as of episode six, they're in their second year of high school, uh, 11th grade. And Kaoru and Ritsuko are in the same class, but Sentaro is not. And he's not super happy about that, because he's never been in a different class from Ritsuko, I guess. And so he's getting in fights. Yep. Ritsuko has taken Sentaro to the infirmary because he got he got a bunch of beat up on his face from a fight with a dude. Uh, so while Ritsuko's patching up Sentaro, because Kaoru's trying to push Ritsuko toward Sentaro, to make her happy at least. Uh, he goes to see Yurika, who's working on her painting, and tells her that June hasn't been at his apartment in Tokyo for a while. And she's like, oh, well, he probably missed an important letter, that being hers. And then uh, later, we go to back to the record store, and Centaur's talking about, or Yurika finished her painting, I guess. And I guess it wants to go on a date with Sentaro to a celebration? Uh, something like that. Karu recommends that he doesn't do that because he says that Sentaro will just bone it up. I, th I think Karu knows that she has the hots for June anyways. Because he saw, the, he saw the letter, right? Yeah, that's why they have that moment there. So yeah. it's kind of like a realization for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Centaur does it anyway, and was pretty unhappy that they ended up talking about June the entire time, and how cool June is, and how he was a badass in school, and you kind of, you learn about, uh, I guess, how Centaur views him, why he calls him Brother June. He was a older brother figure to him growing up, since he didn't really have parental guidance stuff going on either. And then we also meet Seiji who's in the art club with Yurika, and I really hate this dude. Yeah, this is one of the few missteps in the show, I guess, where they... I'm, uh, I'm not sure if it's a misstep. Oh, I would definitely class it as a misstep. Like, his characterization is just, like, you know, typically the show is pretty decent with subtlety and letting the, the, the viewer read into stuff or whatever, mm -hmm. but they just go completely over the top with this guy. It's like, oh, you get, okay, we get it. He's gay. You're like, you know, you don't have to I mean, that's beat not, us over the that's, head with it. That's not what I was picking up at all. I didn't even think about that. Well, he's extremely effeminate, like, comedically. Yeah, that doesn't mean he's gay necessarily, but he was, he just seemed kind of like an asshole. He was purposely trying to break up Centaro and Kaoru so that Centaur would join their band because he wants to be like the Beatles. I didn't. Th I don't think that's. It was quite that simple. I think. Uh, I don't think it was a specific like I'm trying to break these two up. I think that's what Kaoru was reading into it. I think he just. Yeah, I you guess. Know, he has a goal of wanting to become a pop star, and he thinks Centauri can help him do it, and he just, you know, was doing whatever. Like, it there's takes. no reason. Yeah, there's no reason why a drummer can't be in more than one band at once, you know? It's mm -hmm. not as if he needs to dedicate all his time to one or the other. Yeah, I guess. But anyway, so he asks Centaur to join his band to play at the festival, and Centaur doesn't know whether he should or not. So he's thinking on it. Uh, and then Centaur invites Ritsuko and Kaoru to go to the beach to help uh, just hang out with his siblings and take care of them. And then Seiji shows up there too. And starts charming everyone, except for Kaoru. And when Centaur decides to join the band, Kaoru throws a fit and storms off. And basically says that he doesn't need Sen anymore. Which is a... It's a it's an interesting moment because, uh, you know, they acknowledge that he's being childish when he does this. But mm -hmm. it it's pretty easy to empathize with his stance, like... Yeah, I mean, I you know I identified with I did I tend to identify with a lot of the stuff that Kaoru's feeling, not necessarily the exact situations, but the way he's feeling going through them. Kind of resonates with my personality. Like I don't, 
I don't identify with his actions so much as just, you know, some of the emotions he's gone through. I can, I, I completely understand why he's doing stuff he's doing and acting like he's doing. So I can see myself possibly doing those things. Maybe not, maybe not 100% of the time, but I can see a reality in which, yeah, I would do that. Yeah, it's just dumb kid stuff, really. Mm-hmm. Which is sort of the point of the show, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so after that, uh, Cool Dad goes to the jazz bar and sees June basically, like, almost blackout drunk there. And then the episode ends. Was there anything else in that episode? Oh, there, there's talking in the Seiji's nerd band about, oh, who's our drummer going to be? And Seiji's like, oh, you'll see. You'll see. And it's uh, Seiji and Train Kid and some other dude. Don't they speak at, like, a weigh-in of some sort? A what? It's like a, a weigh-in. Like, they're being measured and weighed and stuff. The, the, oh, yeah. Uh, that's, the boys? Like, that's like a school physical thing. Japanese schools do that. They check yeah, your that's... height and weight and... Never seen anything like that, so it just came up very strange to me. It's a Japanese school thing. It's weird. But um, I think the thing that uh, Centauri kind of opens up about uh, is that he discovers that uh, Seiji seems to be uh, poor, like him. Mm-hmm. So he identifies with that, and he wants to help him out the one time. That seems to be the, the main reason why he eventually says yes. Mm-hmm. So episode seven. Oh, we forgot one thing that's kind of an important detail. Okay. Uh, Centauri says that it's only like a temporary thing and yeah. for Kaoru not to worry, but he still reacts like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's pretty important. Yeah, and you, you see kind of like a flashback where he's had similar things happen to him with friends in school, I guess because he's moved around a lot. I guess he has some PTSD-type stuff going on with the situation. Yeah, which I can understand. Really. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so as of episode 7, Kaoru is still not cool with Sentaro, and Sen hasn't been going to the record store because he's been practicing rock music with uh, Beatles Kid and Train Kid and other dude, Rich Kid, I think. <laughs> rich asshole kid. Yeah, he's kind of a dick, isn't he? Yep. But he has all the instruments, so... And he's a bass player, so fuck him. You don't like bass players? I don't, I don't know if this is... Like a universal thing, but in my experience, bass players are most often like the, the biggest dickheads. Oh, I don't know, man. Just something about that instrument, like it attracts a lot it, of just bass guitar. Or like, are you counting? Yeah, bass guitar, bass? not okay, not yeah. Yeah, not a stand up bass or anything. But stand up bass is considerably cooler than a bass guitar. Oh, definitely. But when it comes to bass guitar, it, it attracts a lot of like like shitty musicians, I guess. Mm-hmm. People who don't take their music very seriously. Mm-hmm. Because it's an easier instrument, kind of. Like, yeah, that's that's what I've always gotten. People that I know who are like, oh, I won't learn bass. It's like, because it's an easy, easier thing. The way that I put it is that bass is easy to play badly, but extremely hard to play well. Mm-hmm. So you just get a lot of shitty bassists out there that can, like, kind of play the bass. Mm-hmm. They can play the, uh, what was it, paperback writer riff? I don't and think I know happened. that one, actually. The Beatles? No, I know the song, I just don't know the riff. I think it's... Or maybe it's not bass. But it's... Da, 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 Except I'm... I'm oh, I'll uh, look it up later. I'm tone deaf, so that's probably sounding nothing like it. But... Who knows, I'll, I'll have to look up and check. Yeah. But yeah, stand-up bass is cool. Cool Dad plays stand-up bass. Yeah. And that's a hard instrument because you don't have frets to rely on. Yep. You need Again, very good an- intonation. Another instrument my sister fucking picked up in two weeks. I'd hang out with your sister, play music. I I would too if I could play music. I actually I'm. I remember the today that she has a pocket trumpet that she never uses. Oh yeah. And I've never touched a brass instrument, so I was like, maybe I should try that. So when I go home next week, she's going to try and. Give me a crash course on how to use that thing. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll like the trumpet. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe you can ask her to teach you the uh, minor pentatonic scale, and you know, Probably. once you learn that scale, you can just sort of jam on it. 
I'm sure I'm sure she knows it. Oh, she definitely will. Yeah. Yes. I've I've never touched a I've only ever done stringed instruments and piano. So maybe it's just those instruments I don't care for. Yeah, I've never played a a, a brass instrument or like a woodwind or anything like that. I don't even know how a trumpet works. It's, they're kind of hard to get into because they're expensive to start. Well, yeah, brass is kind of an expensive material. Yeah. But we'll see. I know you kind of have to, like, purse your lips and blow out through it or something and make a farty sound. But I don't know the mechanics of it. The valves change the distance the air has to travel to go out the big hole. I guess I'd call that a relative pitch instrument, though I'm not certain. I think a lot of the sound you're making with your mouth, too. I'm not, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? We'll see. Maybe I'll come back in the last Kids on the Slope episode, like in playing the trumpet. I don't know. Maybe not that quickly. Oh, well, I might don't like it. get ahead it. of yourself. I might enjoy it and want to continue learning it. Well, yeah, but, you know. Steal my sister's trumpet. Don't expect to be playing songs uh, that quickly or anything. Who knows, maybe I'm a prodigy and I just don't know it. Yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm almost certainly not. I'm not good at things. Well, I'm definitely no prodigy, that's for damn certain. Uh, well, let's see, where were we? We're up to episode 7, I guess. Yeah, so we started episode 7, so... They're practicing rock music. Uh, Centaur goes to the music store. And brings... And Eureka's there. And he brings her to the basement to try and... Uh, pull a cowroo on her, but June is in the basement, uh, presumably hungover, or just, ch- I, don't, I don't know what he's doing. He was down there. I guess Cool Dad's letting him crash there until he gets back on his feet a little bit. Uh, and then Eureka freaks out because June's there, and Centaur punches June in the face for getting in the way of his smooch time. Yeah, what a joke. Uh, back at school, uh, they're getting ready for the school festival that Centaur joined the band for. Uh, school festivals are a thing that Japanese schools have, just so you know. I know about that from Persona 4. Good. Oh yeah, you've played Persona 4 like ten times, haven't you? Well, I finished it twice, but you know, that's still like, you know, 150 hours of game or something. I don't think I've ever finished that one. Oh man, it's so good! I fo- I watched the giant bomb, all of that. Oh, no, I haven't. I had never watched the last episode of it. I've watched almost all the giant bomb one. It's so good. I played Persona. I played all of Persona Three. Persona Three is less good, but still very good. I I like it more, but I can see why most people prefer Persona Four. Ah, uh, I think you're insane. I think people who prefer Three are literally insane. But you know, I like Me- them both. I like the music in 3 better. By quite a lot. That kind of hip-hop thing that's got gone? Yeah. It's pretty good. Uh, Where are we? Uh, They're preparing for the festival, and Kaur and Ritsuko are nominated to be the the leaders, I guess. At least for their their class, their grade. All of it, I'm not exactly sure. The put-on committee, I think they would call it. Yeah, the executive committee. So they're they're the, uh, the big boys. For this festival, Cent- Centaur dropped by to sign their their band up, and he spelled the name of the group weird, and Kaur was trying to correct him, and sounds like whatever. Which is a very strange bit, by the way, because oh? you have to kind of understand, or at least the... a little bit of the language to yeah. understand what the joke is about. Yeah, um, and then Kaur tries to talk to him, but he's uh, struggling to find the words. And then we get to the festival itself, and they start playing their shitty pop song. The Olympus starts playing their shitty pop song. Like, I guess uh, in the eye catch, Coward corrected it, didn't he? Yeah, it changes from Za Olympus to G Olympus, I think. Yeah, which is, that is a really weird difference, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's a difference that doesn't really matter because they're still just approximating uh, certain yeah. English syllables and neither fit. Yeah. But anyway, as they're performing, their amps break down, or for whatever reason. Yeah, it's weird. 
Like, uh, they never really explain what happens there. Because the electrical system isn't down, and for all their amps to go out at the same time doesn't really make much sense. Could have blown a fuse, I don't know. I don't know how electric instrument stuff works. You plug it in and it works. Yeah. Anyway, so Kaoru's scrambling around trying to figure out how to fix this, how to save the festival, save the day. Uh, and he hears Centaur saying, telling Seiji, who's trying to get him to join the band permanently, saying, no, 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 this this is just a one-time thing. I think he's actually talking to Mauru. Oh, Mauru. Oh, yeah, he's talking to Mauru. He's talking to one of the nerds. Yeah, the fat one. Yeah, train nerd. And then, I guess, uh, Kaoru isn't able to do anything himself because he doesn't know about electric stuff because they don't use any of that stuff at jazz time. Uh, so he sits down at the piano to try and uh, be an intermission show, I guess. And they draw more of a crowd. Their little jam session medley thing. They draw more of a crowd than the original show had. Which is understandable because cause there's a rad fucking medley they were playing. Yeah, this is definitely the kind of the high point so far of the show's like musical numbers, at least. It, it's a really good scene. Yeah, I I would like, you know, this is kind of the show in the nutshell, I guess. Like, some sort of emotional situation that they use music to kind of, like, express the idea a bit more abstractly, mm -hmm. uh, which is cool, I think. Yeah. But anyway, there's like people running all over the school and say, hey. Hey, there's some sweet jazz going on in the auditorium. Come check this out. Uh, so they're after the festival, those two guys are super popular now. All the girls want them. Some of the guys too, probably. And they're getting Hell, interviewed. I'd probably hit it. Probably, yeah. Have you seen Sen? He's pretty big. Dude's built like a tank. He can he can protect your your uh, innocence with his fists. I'd let him. Uh, I think we left out. Uh, kind of an important factor with that medley uh, performance thing is mm -hmm. it seems to make quite an impact on uh, Ritsko when she yeah. uh, hears it. Yeah, because uh, earlier they were, at the very beginning of the episode, uh, for whatever reason, my favorite things was playing, and they were talking about the sound of music. And I think the shitty band club was playing it in was, the distance. Was the band club playing it? And how they were talking about, oh, oh uh, I thought you would like that. It's like, oh, I... Wasn't able to watch all of it for some reason. I regret not seeing it, but I like the song a lot. Uh, so that's yeah. It kind of reminds you that uh, when movies come came out in uh, in that age, you know, they were just there. And they then were basic. Gone. Yeah, they're ephemeral. You know, they're there and then they go away. Then you never get to see it. Mm -hmm. I still have. I've never seen The Sound of Music. Me I've, neither. I saw they did a really, really, really bad. Uh, live production on TV, and I watched that, but I've never seen the Julie Andrews original one that's supposedly good. Yeah, I've never been one for musicals, so I guess I never really sorted it out. I think it's interesting that that's based on a, based on a true story, but I think the... I think the woman who Julie Andrews' character is died in the last couple years? I saw that, like, popping up few places but that song's good yeah and, it's okay i guess and that's the big part of the medley that cower and sen are playing it's that and the someday my prince will come which is what cower transcribed to play to ritsuko when he told her his feelings and then also moaning because that's everywhere yeah that's kind of the show's uh like unofficial theme song i guess yeah and apparently that's one of the first things you learn when you're uh, learning jazz, usually. That's like the ode to joy for jazz. Yeah, as I mentioned in the first episode, it's uh, it's using a very popular scale that is probably one of the first ones that you'll learn when you're learning music. And uh, you kind of have to learn a, to play it in a different pattern, in a different style. So I guess that's probably why they start you off with that. Yeah. Um, so let's see. That's, that's episode 7. So let's get over to 8. Uh, do you have anything else about 7? Um, no, not really, apart from that medley being pretty badass. Yeah. Oh, that, at the, did you watch any of the stuff after the credits? I tried watching them, but they just went completely over my head. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about, so okay, I just kept so skipping yeah. them. So yeah, the one for episode seven, it was Centaur's 
I guess Centaur in character was saying different things. He's like, oh, this is how you say this insult in standard Japanese, and this is how we say it down here in Kyushu. Yeah, that's what I that's what I mean. Like I just when they're talking about that stuff, I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about, so I just skip it. Yeah, yeah, it's it, that stuff's real hard to translate, but I think it's pretty neat that they're just kind of doing weird shit like that and just showing scenes from the next episode, just kind of out of hand. It's like, oh, look, this stuff's going on too. Yeah, a lot of good stuff about the show, and uh, I guess if I had more of a cultural understanding of Japan, I would appreciate that more, but I just have no idea what they're t- talking about. Yeah, I think in episode 5, it was the train kid just talking about the different train lines. And they, they talk about that stuff really fast, too, so it's like I'm like yeah. throwing out lots of different things constantly, I'm like, what, wait, what? Uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, the pace they're going with that is basically the pace that... Uh, the show Tatami Galaxy moved at the entire first episode, one of the ones we were considering for this. Well, then I'm glad I didn't pick that show, because uh, it's... Yeah, I can't follow stuff when it goes that quickly. Yeah, it's uh, difficult. Let's see. Episode 8. Uh, we find out what is the deal with June. Uh, first off, uh, they're very... Kaoru and Centaur are very popular. As you would be, I guess, after something like that. Yeah. I guess it's important to remember that, you know, high school performances of music are typically pretty shit. Mm Mm-hmm. So when you have, like, two, like, properly professional musicians do something like that, I'm sure, like, anywhere, any school around the world would probably have a similar reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But we find out what the deal with June is. Uh, He apparently... Uh, got into a big political movement. Uh, And in the late 60s in Japan, there were a lot of student riots on in uh, Tokyo University. Or I I forget if it's a lot or there's just one big one. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe sporadic demonstrations followed by a big one or something? Yeah. Um, It was uh, for a lot of stuff. Um, I think a lot of it was uh, about, like, the U.S. occupation and some other stuff. I don't know the exact details, uh, but I know that stuff was going on at this point, and it seems that Jun was super involved with them. Yeah, it seems the implication is that it's a uh, communist movement, like a leftist uh, yeah, organization. I think, I think the the Communist Party was pretty big thing at that point and i think it still has like not not insign i mean the japanese political system is basically a one-party system so basically anything except the ruling the party that's been going since it was formed is kind of insignificant to a point but it's not like whatever we have in america or somewhere else where it's just kind of oh hey i guess there's somebody in that probably yeah, the uh, the whole, like, a political party with 12,000 members, that sort of thing. Yeah, but it seems like he was involved in that, and he uh, eventually, after enough shit went down, he dropped out of that movement and then dropped out of college completely, and that caused his dad to disown him. And his dad, I think, didn't want him to go to school in Tokyo in the first place. So this is just the the last nail in the coffin. He seemed to have uh, had inspired another fellow musician to join the movement, mm-hmm. and, and that, that musician results got in his that hands musician broken. getting his hands, uh, yeah, his hands get broken, and uh, which you know, musicians tend to need those. Yeah, if something that major happens to your hands, you're, you're not going to be a musician anymore. It's just not possible. Yeah, there's prob there's probably some instrument you can, but it wasn't whatever one they were doing. I think it was another brass. Uh, I think it was another trumpet player. Yeah. Yeah. Like drums are... you can play the recorder. Drums are like maybe trombone or something you could probably manage, but... Well, you need quite a lot of finger dexterity to play the drums. Oh, I guess then, yeah. But, I mean, now there's the... You've heard about uh, the robot drum dude, right? Where he got a robot hand built for him? After he lost nope. use of one? And it has like a... Is like two drumsticks in it? And one of them is has like a thinking computer thing that kind of figures out 
the beat that he's playing, and one of them's just on a a loop. It has a motor that goes. So he he effectively has three drumsticks, and it's pretty pretty cool. The music he's able to to play like that, and that he was able to do the music again in general because he had some sort of accident that took his hand. Hmm, sounds interesting. I guess I forget how I saw that. I think it I think it was something about robotics and not something about music. It might have been something during the Grammys, actually. I don't know. But yeah, in the 60s, they wouldn't have had robot drum hands. Definitely not. Uh, so yeah, June's been disowned, and that's why he was in the bar, and that's why Cool Dad let him chill in the jazz basement for a while. But June has his own place now, and Eureka finds him and follows him back to his apartment and confronts him about a kiss they apparently had at the record shop. Which was off screen, I guess? I guess so, yeah. And then he comes on to her really hard to try and make her go away, but she doesn't. Yeah, like it. She sees through his bullshit. Yeah, it's kind of an awkward moment, but he tries to scare her into thinking he's going to rape her, which is, you know, probably not a cool thing to do to somebody. Yeah. Probably not. Definitely not. Definitely not. But it doesn't work. It's kind of an interesting uh, connective thread, but you can. She tells, she's able to tell that uh, that he's lying because he can. Uh, she feels his heartbeat and mm-hmm. tells that it's elevated. Mm-hmm. So you know, regular Sherlock Holmes there. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting uh, thing that kind of connects the previous scene because you can see Ritzko has like, uh, you know, they start to reveal that she's. Possibly got some feelings for uh Yeah, she's starting Kauru. to f- she's starting to come around on Kaoru. And she's really confused about what's going on with her. They use the heartbeat thing to kind of signify that. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's like a small element that kind of connects the two scenes together. Yeah. Um and then Yurika cuts her hair to prove that she'll I'm not sure why she cut her hair. Is to make some sort of point to Jun. Well, I guess it, the the long hair might have signified, like, immaturity. Maybe. But that's when we see the flashback of uh, his buddy who he got into the movement getting his hands broke. So I guess it w- that her cutting her hair was uh, bringing back some bad memories of a similar thing that happened with his other instrument buddy who did a similar thing. Kind of a feeling of res- responsibility there, I guess. Yeah. But uh, the people at school noticed clearly notice Yurika's uh, new haircut and that she's been acting different. And Sen hears this and I guess assumes that it's Jun did something to her that she's not uh, not coping with well. And he goes to Jun's apartment to see what's up and sees Yurika there and he's not happy about that. Uh, it I guess it kind of confirms all his his worries about having no chance with her. Which is a bummer for him, I guess. Yeah, that sucks. Sin seems like a, a kind of exceptionally good person, and he's kind of getting the short end of the stick all eight of these episodes. Yeah, something I thought was interesting is um, apparently the original title of the manga of this series is like Apollo on the Slope or something? Yeah, it's uh, Sakamichi no Apollo, and I forget... Apollo on the slope, yeah. And that uh, that previous episode kind of places Centauri as being Apollo, so... Oh, how so? I'm not sure I get the, the reference here. Well, do you remember in the painting? What painting? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, and that, that kind of places Centauri as being like an Apollo sort of figure within the mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. And so I guess that's kind of like the show's way of saying that this is... a actually about Centauri when not the other characters? Yeah, I can see that. Anyway, so Sen goes back to the record shop, I guess, or he ends up there eventually and tells Kaoru about what's going on. And Kaoru listens, but kind of tells him off a little bit for not realizing that Ritsuko basically liked him forever. Well, he implies it very strongly. Yeah, and then he realizes what Kaoru's talking about. And I guess he's confused about that. And then the episode basically ends there, right? Yeah. And it ended at a 
big fucking cliffhanger. Yeah, man. It's like I said in the first episode. This show is using more of like a cinematic structure. So I guess that this would be the end of the second act. Yeah, and I was so tempted to just keep watching, but it was already like three in the morning, and also I didn't want to watch it this far that far ahead of the next time we're going to record. Yeah, I'd be lying if I said I uh, didn't think about doing that. Yeah, this show's so good. Yeah, like I, I was a, a, I think the first four episodes, like it opens very strongly and then mm-hmm. it kind of tapers off a little bit, but then it picks up real hard. Yeah, these these episodes five to eight pick up really well, and like I kind of love this show. And it's not pulling its punches either. It's socking you in the gut every chance it gets. It's really emotionally charged. The only like big criticism that I still have and that I hope that they fix in the last four is that Ritsko still kind of doesn't have a personality of her own. I mean, she's she seems like she's been just kind of confused about her feelings the whole time or not or her feelings haven't been kind of at the forefront, but it seems like it's picking up to work her into the fabric of this. Yeah, I'm interested to see where they go because like when she starts talking about how much she likes that uh, My Favorite Things uh, song and that how she was never able to see the movie and stuff, like, that's the most of her character that we've seen so far. Like, that's the only real thing that you learn about her. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they've... I, I think for the show to make good on its promise and to make good on what it's been doing and what it's been building up to, they need to do something with her character. Yeah. At least a little something, because I, I do think that it's still the Kaoru Sentaro relationship, what ends up happening there, is the most important thing. But they need to not leave that end loose. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's just, um, I think, like, she's such a central figure to the show that if they if they don't make good on her character, that I'm probably going to be pretty disappointed. But mm-hmm. I think I'm willing to give the show a benefit of the doubt, because... Uh, it's done very well with uh, character moments so far, mm-hmm. and um, it's quite deftly written, and so I hope they're doing something with that. Yeah, I mean, I I might go read the comics after we're done with it, too, because I'm sure that this is, I think it's like 10, 10 uh, volumes of the graphic novel, so I'm sure this is condensing a lot of stuff down, too. Yeah, the graphic novel, if it's 10... Uh, like uh, issues or whatever, then it's probably vastly expanded. Yeah, so ten volumes with probably, I want to guess, five or six chapters per volume. So I'm probably going to read it once we're done with this, unless I doubt it's going to happen that the end's going to leave an incredibly... St- At this point, I have to basically give me the finger and shove it in my eyes for me to hate this. Yeah, same. I think even if they don't uh, like make good on Ritsko's character, they will still... I'd still quite like it. It just wouldn't be fucking excellent anymore. Yeah, they they really need to do something there. And I'm I'm kind of worried about it, but I'm giving the show the benefit of the doubt. I think they'll they'll make some good at least. At the ver at the very least, I'm pretty confident that the comic will, even if the show had to do something for time's sake. Cuz there's only only so much you can do with an adaptation. I understand that. Yeah, you got to cut what doesn't makes sense uh time wise and pacing wise so yeah sometimes you have to leave an important character bit on the table mm-hmm. anyway that's episodes five through eight of kids on the slope uh next week i am out of town so there will be a short bonus episode on a short called death billiards instead and then we'll pick up the next week after that so that will be the first week of of May. We will finish off Kids on the Slope, after which we will be starting Chihaya Furu, which is uh, about an esoteric card game and the people who play it. And it's of the same demographic as this, and I've heard it has super, super excellent character work from multiple sources, including multiple people I know whose opinions I trust. But is it going to do that anime thing? You know that when somebody's doing like a competition or something and they've got a bunch of characters around them that are like 
uh, narrating what they're doing. Like, whoa, how did he do that? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Maybe a little bit. Not sure. I don't know. But it's going to do it a whole bunch. And it's going to annoy the shit out of me. I'm curious how they uh, will make a card game about recognizing poetry versus interesting. Oh, that is that what the game's about? I didn't that's know. What, that, that's what Karta is. It'll, uh... Somebody will read the first... In front of you, you'll have a bunch of lines that is... A bunch of cards that have poems on them. And somebody will re- read the first line of the poem. And you have to slap the card with the rest of the poem before the other person. So it's like a weird literary version of Snap? Kind of, yeah. That's that's weird. Uh, it's a it's a very old game. It's something that uh, I think it originated in the Ham period, which is like the eight hundreds to twelve hundreds. I want to say I've talked about the Ham period so much during this podcast. I should, and the fact that it is what I studied the most in my undergrad. I should know when the fuck it is, but I'm pretty sure it comes from way back then, and something the noble people did to pass the time, since it, that was a high art period. Yeah, I was about to say, it sounds a lot like something this, the aristocracy would be doing. Like, yeah. it, it's a really, like, intellectually elitist sort of sounding game. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I'm... I'm going to say 80% sure that it comes from back then. But it's a kind of strange subject for a series, and I'm pretty interested to see how they make that uh, compelling. Maybe they go really goofy with it? Maybe. It's It's super popular, too. They got a they got a second season, and I think there's rumors of a third season. They got a live action movie somehow. We'll oh see. Boy. We'll get to it. Right now, we're only committing the first season. Who knows? Maybe we'll love maybe it. Maybe if we, yeah, if we like it, maybe continue. Yeah. No promises. Never make promises you, you don't want to keep. Yep, I've already done that once, and regretted it. Season. Oh, one. we know. Rip. Rip. Uh, but anyways, thanks for listening. You, As always, you can reach us by email at anime at gamekiwi.net. Uh, send in questions, comments, suggestions, uh, well wishes, hate letters to Doter, love letters to me. Uh, you can also catch us on Twitter at the Game Kiwi, as well as on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Game Kiwi. Uh, whether you're listening to us through your podcatcher or on podcasts.gamekiwi.net or on the YouTube, go over to the YouTube and like and subscribe to this channel, comment, uh, go over to podcast.gamekiwi, uh, subscribe to us there. I forget what kind of stuff I have there, like, I guess, the audio file? And put us in your RSS feed. Make sure you're always up to date with our podcast goings on. At some point in the near future, we're going to be starting a video game podcast that we're shooting for once a month-ish. That'll be me and Cat Doter and one of my friends. And who knows, there might be other people. I don't know. We're playing that kind of loosey-goosey. Uh, and then I'll also, me and a few of my other friends will be starting a tabletop podcast thing that I haven't hammered out all the details with. And that'll be exciting. I think that's it. Yeah, sounds like it. Hashtag engage with us. Yeah, man. Remember the monetize teens tag or whatever it was. Even if you're not a teen, we would love to monetize you. We'd love to so hard. Uh, But yeah, that's it. Thanks again. I'm Mike. I'm Katoda. As always, keep it anime.